First of all, I, I want to extend a thank you to you as our church family for your kindness and love that was expressed last week uh, in the cards, in the financial gift. Uh, we went home after church and we sat down and opened up those cards and read them and it was very, very touching and very meaningful and um, as Nancy said, kind of hard to read, some of them especially, but uh, we really want to thank you for that and that was a gift. That was really a gift to us and we appreciate it so much. I think most of you know that, that we were in business in South Dakota for numbers of years, many years actually, and, and back in, I think it was 1981, if I get my dates and years right, it was 90, 1981 where we went to a little town where I had met my wife. I met her there and pulled her away and then we got pulled back and we started a business there from scratch. When we moved to Winter, we did not have a customer. And the only people I knew in town were people from the little church you know, that Nancy was a part of, and there were no business people in this church to my knowledge. I mean, they were, they were just kind of just common people. They weren't no movers and shakers, so to speak, in the community when we moved there. And yet God supplied. It was a little, little bit lean, on my end especially, for the first few years. Uh, Nancy worked, and so we lived off her wage, and then when she became pregnant with our oldest, uh, it was just amazing how God just works this out, that um, nine months before the baby was born, I could not support the family. But the month that the, uh, Heather was born into our world, the cash started flowing. Isn't that amazing how that works? It just does that. Well, it was still lean somewhat for years. It wasn't plentiful, but our needs were met. And uh, in our community, there was a large employer. It might be like, I don't know how to describe them, but if you're going to come into a place and say, I want to work for a business, you know, that has the most employees of anyone in town, save the hospital, that one I would like to work for. Well, I had met the owner, and it was rather kind of a nervous type of time when I met him. That's a story by itself. But I had met him and went back to my office and thinking, oh, that's hopeless, that's never going to happen. Well, one day, uh, I don't know what year it was, but several years into this, uh, he walked in the door. And I was kind of like surprised, and I knew him by name, and he sat down and he says, well, tell you what, I've, I've, I'm interested in having you work for me. And he's a very blunt and honest type of person, and he says, well, very good. And he says, let me tell you what happened. The guy who worked for me before messed up. And uh, he messed up, and it cost some money, and he says, I'm ready to change. So with this for myself, I was like, this is excitement, but it also made me very, very nervous. Very nervous, because I know how human I was, and my competitor had a lot more experience than I did. And it was, well, it was kind of like, okay, I'm excited to do this. And the business did come, and we started working together, and things went fine. And again, I lose track of time, but there was a time of three years later, something like that, where he walked in the door and, and he was carrying an, an envelope, you know, that in his hand. And I recognized that envelope. I'd seen those envelopes before. I didn't have to look at who it was from. <laughs> it's from the IRS. And he came and he laid it on my desk and he says, here. He says, got a problem. I don't remember much of the conversation, but I remember looking at it and saying, okay, I'll get back to you. And so I took this envelope and I went to my desk in the back and he left it and left it in my hands. And, and as I was reading through it, uh, I go, ooh, the inevitable happened. Uh, it was tax due and a sizable amount, thousands of dollars of tax was due for this corporate business. And I sat there and looking at it and wondering, okay, what should I do? What should I do now? John the Baptist, he came into the world in a miraculous way. The story of John the Baptist is found in, in four different, all, all the Gospels. We read about him a little bit, and so we're going to look at this somewhat and, and pull pieces together of his story and then come back to mine. John was, had a supernatural birth. His mother was... Elizabeth, Elizabeth was old and she had was barren and so she, she was well beyond childbearing years and yet God promised John's dad, there's going to be a son born. And he came into this world and he came in with a very special calling. His calling was to prepare the way for Jesus, to, to tread the path, make it wide, make it straight, make it so people would focus on Jesus, not on him. 
and John baptized people. Surprised? John the Baptist? And baptism wasn't initiated by John. There was actually baptism in the Old Testament. So I read that in the Old Testament, though, they baptized proselytes, people who wanted to become Jews, who put their faith in, in Jehovah God. And so they had a ceremonial type of baptism for them. But when John started baptizing people, he was baptizing Jews. And so this was new in that respect. And this baptism was to demonstrate a recognition that these individuals recognized that they were sinful and that there was a desire for God to clean their insides, clean them from the inside out, and that some level of commitment to follow the way, follow the law, all in preparation for the Messiah who is coming, who is actually there. So we're going to read both from Luke and from Matthew this account, and I'm going to zigzag back and forth and so if you follow with me, if you have your Bible, you can follow along or just listen, and I'm going to go back and forth in these two um, Gospels concerning this account. So for Luke chapter 3, 1 through 6. It was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. And Pontius Pilate was governor over at Galilee, and his brother Philip was ruler in another area. Anna, Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. At this time, a message from God came to John, son of Zechariah, who was living in the wilderness. Then John went from place to place on both sides of the Jordan River, preaching that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled, and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened, and the rough places made smooth. And then all people will see the salvation sent from God. So in these few verses, these two main thoughts I want to share with you is that our baptism was to, was to show that they had repented of their sins and that they had turned to God. This is what John was calling them to. Not just baptism, but to repent and then to demonstrate it. And his mission was to help people see that salvation from God came through Jesus. Now I'm going to go to Matthew chapter 3 and read the first 10 verses. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to watch him baptize, he denounced them. You brood of snakes, he exclaimed, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Even now the axe of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. So from these few verses, a few thoughts I want to share. His message was repent and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And this implies that there's a level of urgency that this be done and be done now. Second is that there were people from all over the area that came to see and hear or listen. And then it speaks here of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who came to watch. That's why they came. So we're going to go back to Luke chapter 3. Just kind of jump back and forth and pick up with verse 10. The crowds asked, 
What should we do? John replied, If you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be, came to be baptized and asked, Teacher, what should we do? He replied, Collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. And John replied, Don't extort money or make false accusations, and be content with your pay. And so now we have the, the common folks again that are coming, and they're listening, they're hearing the words of John, this message was repent, and they asked the question, what should we do? And the three groups that are identified here are the common folks, and the reply was, is if you have two shirts, share one. Man, I don't know what John would say to me if he looked in my closet. He'd say, Tim, you got 22 shirts in there. Share half. If you have food, you see the hungry, feed them. So probably this group, why they were maybe dealing with some areas of selfishness, of self-centeredness, and say, okay, how do I demonstrate that I have a repentant heart that I want to follow God? Share. So then there's the tax collectors, the Zacchaeus type, who you know they, they were the ones that would go out and collect the taxes, and they could charge, and they charge what they wanted to, and they, there was probably a set amount, but they had the ability to charge more and take advantage of poor people. And so there were some there that said, okay, what should we do? And the answer was collect no more than the law requires. And then the soldiers. I imagine, because the messages don't extort, I imagine that the soldiers were probably doing some of this. There's a business over there, and if there's a riot or there's a disturbance, it's kind of like, well, tell you what, if you just feed me a little bit of money on a regular basis, I'll protect you when you call 911. But if you don't, I just might not answer the call with my caller ID when I figure out who it is, right? And so what should I do? They're feeling some guilt also, and, and it's like, don't extort money. They were paid. Be content with your pay. Repentance. Repentance is a, sub, a word that is often shied away from by popular preachers especially, by maybe pastors in a general sense. That's a word that we kind of really don't like to use too often. It simply means a change of mind that results in a change of direction or action but often it's used in the context of sin, and in the Bible it's always used in the context of sin that we should change. And there's something that's just not Minnesota nice or isn't you know, politically correct to look at someone and say, repent. So we're a little bit hesitant to do that. And yet John's message, that's really what he did. And it didn't matter if it was the rich or the poor. It didn't matter if, if they were the religious types or those who had very little knowledge of Scripture. It didn't matter if it was those who were paying the taxes or those who were demanding taxes or those who were ruling. His message was the same. And so as he pronounced this message, it's not popular everywhere. And one especially that John was not popular with was Herod. And we read about Herod here. I'm going to read a couple places, but in chapter 3 of Luke, it says, John also public, publicly criticized Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee, for marrying Herodias, his brother's wife, and for many other wrongs he had done. And so Herod put John in prison, adding this sin to his many others. And then a larger account of this is found in Matthew chapter 14. And I think I'm going to read, just begin with verse 3. It says, For Herod had arrested and imprisoned John as a favor to his wife Herodias, the former wife of Herod's brother Philip. John had been telling Herod, It is against God's law for you to marry. I'm betting you used the word repent in there somewhere. He says, Herod wanted to kill John. But he was afraid of a riot because all the people believed John was a prophet. And yet John, being put in prison, never left alive. He actually left in two pieces. And so he, his message wasn't popular. There's this struggle. I think Herod also had the question, what should I do? 
when John came to him and said, it's wrong for you to take your brother's wife. From what I read in history, it's likely that, that Philip, who was Herodias' first wife, husband, was probably away in Rome, and whether it was for political reasons or whether it was for lust reasons, he took this woman to be his wife. And John saw it as wrong and wasn't afraid to call him out. I think Herod wanted to silence the message. I think he wanted to silence that voice. Now he was hesitant too because he knew that the crowds respected John for the most part. And it could cause a riot. And so he was hesitant too to do anything to silence him. But he wanted to silence him. And at least in my experience, when I want a silence, a conviction of telling me I'm doing something wrong or telling me that I should be doing something that's right, normally that conviction becomes louder, not quieter, at least for a time. And I think that's the way it works, is that the voice, the feeling, this voice, this conviction becomes louder. And if it ever becomes quiet and I haven't changed, it's a scary day. Because that means that God's becoming more distant. And I'm severing, I'm getting a bigger wall between myself and the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we struggle in life with sin or we struggle with patterns in life that, that are just difficult to break. And I'm, I was thinking through this and going, okay, in my life or in our lives individually, you know, what are, what's going on when we have these struggles that we just can't seem to get victory over? So is it because I am simply unwilling to change and I've got this, this hook that I'm willing to go 90%, but I just can't let this hook go, so I just keep getting pulled in? Is it that or is it because I'm stuck? And I really can't set myself free like I'd like to because I need someone else to help me with it. I think it could be both, either or, maybe both at one time. That sometimes we have a, an issue where we just really want to become clean, but we don't want to let go. And when we don't let go, that change still has a hold of me. And other times, I need help. There are many reasons for all of this. And yet, ultimately, it falls on me. James tells us that temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. And so if I am tempted, I can't blame you. I can't blame, blame uh, some seductively dressed lady out there. I can't blame her. It's my fault. It's the desires within me that entice me and drag me away. And when these desires give birth to sinful actions or I act on it or I give in to temptation and this sin is allowed, it gives birth to death. And it happens in many, many ways. I think death happens in many ways in life where we, there's a separation, there's a death because we've given in to temptation. But the worst death is that which, which is a separation from God. In Isaiah 59, it says, Isaiah is speaking to the nation, the nation who was turning their back on God. He said, it is your sins, God speaking through Isaiah, it is your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. And that's a sobering call. Is if God doesn't listen anymore. And yet I believe there's one prayer that God will always listen to and it's not necessarily the God, help me, I'm in trouble. But it's, I'm a sinner, God. I am in trouble. A prayer of repentance is never turned down by God. To be set free from whatever this pattern is in my life or your life, to be set free requires repentance. And it's not just saying no to sin and saying, well, I'm just not going to do this anymore. But it's saying yes to God. Yes to truth. Yes to love. I think it involves saying yes to some disciplines. Now, we don't earn our way to heaven. We know that. But saying yes to disciplines helps me to break free from bondages that keep dragging me in. So the disciplines could be coming to church and worshiping together. It can be having an accountability partner. It can be joining a small group. It's definitely going to involve God's word. 
To be set free requires change on our part. There's a verse in 2 Timothy, and I really want to focus kind of on the middle of this, but in context I'll read it. It says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And I look at him going, what's the benefits of repentance? In this passage, it appears that our world of knowledge and truth expands when we deal with sin in our lives and repent and change. Now, I think that God gives us some knowledge up front, knowledge definitely that this is wrong, but when we don't address dealing with what's wrong in our lives, I think that there are certain things that just remain hidden from us. But when we submit to God and we say, God, I repent, I want to change directions, help me, I think he opens our eyes to see things that we couldn't see before. You know, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, there's the count of David and David with Bathsheba. And this is such a contrast to the story with Herod. You know, David had committed this, this lustful, sinful act with another man's wife, and then he went about seeing that she, her husband would be killed. He tried to cover it all up, and I think at one point in time, he probably thought he had covered it all up. And now he could just move on with life. One more wife. Doesn't sound like moving on easy to me, but, you know, how they did it beyond me. But regardless, he thought he was going to move on until God sent a messenger. It wasn't John the Baptist. It was Nathan. And Nathan, another one of God's prophets, came to him and he told him a story of an injustice. And he explained this to David and in this injustice, David became angry. He says, that man is guilty. He should be punished. And Nathan stuck his finger in his chest and he says, you're the one. And instantly, instantly, he knew that David or Nathan was talking about him the whole time instantly. But David, his response was so different than the King Herod. His response was instantly, I have sinned against the Lord. Not, I have sinned against Bathsheba, and he definitely did. Not that he sinned against her husband Uriah, and he definitely did. But I have sinned against the Lord. And I think he put together that this sin that we do against people is actually sin against God and it affects our relationship with God, this vertical relationship. So often we look at sin and we think of sin as, as a, a failure to perform. You know, kind of like when I was performing, doing my job at my desk and I made a mistake. Now, if, if failing to meet a standard, you know, failing to meet a standard is a sin, then I sinned in my office because I failed to meet the standard. I couldn't get there. I didn't get there. So often we, we look at sin as this, well, I failed to meet, meet a standard. Let's go on with life and let's brush it out and let's start fresh and anew. But there's a relational side of sin and I think David understood this to a degree at least and probably grew in his understanding when he repented and said, I've sinned. And he confessed before God that there's there's this, our relationship with God is impacted. And the only way to restore it is to repent, change directions, turn from God. Don't cover it up. Confess it with our mouth. Go to those we've offended. Make it right. Back to John the Baptist. The common person, when he felt this guilt, and it was guilt that motivated them to ask this question, he said, what should I do? And the answer was, share what you have. Share what you have. The tax collector, the message was, be content with what you have. And the soldier who was extorting, the message was, don't use your position to unfold fairly get what you don't have. So there again we see this self-centered nature of what the Holy Spirit was working in in the lives of the people that John was preaching to. So we ask, 
what should I do? So I'm sitting at my desk, had this question, what should I do? I knew the likely results. I already knew the type of man I was dealing with. He was an astute businessman. He, he had expectations. And I knew that I was very capable of sinning and falling short. I chose to go to him and confess, first of all. I had to go. I didn't call him into my office. I went to his. And confessed. And I took the letter and I, I, I read it through. And there's a mistake that's been made and I made it. It's my fault. It's no one else's fault. So I confessed my sin. And then I told him, Sir, I will pay the fine. So there's tax and there's a fine. They call it a failure to pay fine. It's a percentage of the amount that's due. So the bigger the amount that is, the bigger the fine. And I told him, I will pay the fine. And his response I'll never forget was, that's better than the last guy did. <laughs> you know, and, and it's kind of like, and I says, I would like to work with you and I will change. So I began to implement changes, and that was the first year we started doing corporate tax returns with a computer. No longer was it going to be calculated on pencil and looking at books and figuring it out. So we invested. See, the, the confession wasn't enough. There's the element of confession, and then there's an element of change or repentance. And I can share, and I found this amazing thing with, with people in general. And if people can be this way, I think God can be so much more this way. You know, I developed a, a long-term relationship with this business. To his generation and his son, who now runs it, and his son, who's going to be taking it over, or probably is by now after we left. So I worked for him for 20 years. A trusting, healthy, friendship relationship with a business that was growing and expanding, and it provided our needs for many, many years. And I think it could have been so much different had I not repented. Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, People who conceal their sins will not prosper, but if they confess and turn from them, they will receive mercy. And I have been the recipient of mercy from people many, many times. Many times. And I'm guessing you would have stories to tell also of mercy that people have given to you when we just say the words, I was wrong, I'll try to do better. 2021, if I'm going to encourage you, if we, you know, I don't really believe in resolutions. You know, it kind of sets us up for failure, right? The tw that idea, but, you know, encouragement. Keep your account short. Keep them short. If you make, make a mistake, if you err and you don't meet the standard or if it's slipping up in a, a standard of temper or anger or words or whatever it is, keep it short. Confess quickly. Ask God to help you change. Change directions before it becomes hard and before it becomes really expensive because it often will. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the account of John. And Lord, I thank you for how you've helped me through life through many, many mistakes I've made many misjudgments. Thank you, Father. I ask you, Lord, that you will guide us, lead us into the new year. Help us, Lord, to resolve to keep accounts short, not just with our, with our neighbors and friends and family, but with you. And that we come quickly to you knowing that you're a gracious God, quick to, quick to forgive, quick to heal. Thank you, Father. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship team, please come. Did you stand with us as we continue in worship as we lift our voices? To the Lord. Father, we ask through Jesus Christ, who gives us access to your throne of grace. 
Lord, that you will receive the offering that we give to you right now. That it would not be just music and words sung, but it would be literally the offering of our heart, Lord. Lord, we praise you simply because you are worthy and deserving of our praise. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name, Hebrews 13, 15. to find the child from heaven. Falling on their knees, they bow before the humble Prince of Peace. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I bring. Jesus, may you song. Um. 
Lord, we just come to you right now, and we do. Lord, we bring an offering. Father, we heard through your word the importance of confession and of repentance, of listening to you, of proving by the way that we live that we are yours. We had a challenge in um, our ladies' Bible study a couple weeks ago that we're doing in um, really reading and speaking forth uh, psalm over our lives. The search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me. See if there's any wicked or deceitful, offensive way in me. And to just pray that every day and to see what God would do and you know, when you pray a prayer like that, he's going to show you. <laughs> he's going to show you the offensive, wicked ways. But it's a good thing because it just completely brings us to that point, like we heard in the message, of knowing what we need to confess, but taking it to that point of a little further, of actually repenting and changing. Because confession is easy. I'm so grateful that we have a God who is sitting, waiting, ready because he loves us so much. And I pray for myself this morning and I pray for each one of us that we would allow the Holy Spirit to work, to do as he wills in us. Lord, I ask you to change me. To search my heart, Lord. I pray for each one of us as we need to hear you because we really do want to be close to you, Lord. We really do want to be more like Jesus. So, Lord, please Bring us to that point of godly sorrow that leads us to repentance. Change us to be more like Jesus to the world around us, but more importantly, in our hearts before you. Thank you, Lord. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Romans 12, verse 1. Yeah. 